Hey guys, Caleb from Gun Nuts Media here, and we've got a quick video today talking about the gun control playbook. And the reason we're talking about this is we have credible reports that House Democrats are going to take up two bills that were introduced last legislative session in the 116th Congress and could be voting on those bills as early as this week. What are those bills? Well, they're House Bill 8 and House Bill 1120. 12, I believe, are the exact bill numbers, and they're both universal background check bills. Now, this is exactly what I said was going to happen, was that if we saw anything come out before the midterm election, it would very likely be a UBC bill, and the reason for that is universal background check bills are what we like to call low-hanging fruit, okay? If you say, we're just trying to close a loophole, we're just trying to eliminate this way that bad guys get guns, it's a lot harder for pro-gun and pro-freedom groups to oppose those bills because the arguments against those bills aren't sound bites. And you can say in a sound bite, we just want to stop people from getting guns who shouldn't get guns because in general, that's something that we agree with. And when everyone's polled on universal background check bills, usually there's a lot of bipartisan support amongst voters for them, largely because people who identify as pro-gun a lot of times don't actually know what UBC bills do. So first, let's talk about what both of these bills do, because they're both background check bills, but they both cover different areas. H.R. 8 and H.R. 1112 both passed the House in the last legislative session, but died in the Republican-controlled Senate, which is a good indicator that they would pass the House again in this new paradigm that we're living in. H.R. 8 is a universal background check bill, and it basically means that any firearms transfer would have to go through an FFL. There are a couple of exceptions written to the law. So for example, buying a gift for your wife or your husband or your child or your stepchildren doesn't require an FFL transfer. Similarly, loaning a gun to your buddy at a shooting range or a USPSA match or for hunting doesn't require an FFL transfer, but it absolutely kills private sales. So if you buy a gun, you have it and you shoot it for six months or whatever and you decide eh, i don't like it and then one of your friends is like hey i'm looking for a blastomatic 9000 and you happen to have just bought that blastomatic 9000 but it's sitting in your safe and you don't really care you can't just sell that gun to your friend that you know isn't a convicted felon anymore you've got to go to an ffl dealer they've got to run a background check on that guy and then the transfer can be completed this is very similar to the system that's already extant in Pennsylvania, but in PA, it's only for handguns. This bill would be for all guns, long guns, handguns, whatever. The second bill, H.R. 112, closes what the left likes to refer to as the Charleston loophole. So that Charleston loophole, which isn't really a loophole, remember, they call anything a loophole when it's just following the law, but they don't like the law. So right now, under the NICS system, if you go in and you do a background check, and after three days, NICS hasn't gotten back to the dealer with a proceed or a deny or a delay with some kind of response, that dealer can legally transfer the gun to you. And I've seen it done, not a lot, but I've definitely seen that sort of thing happen before. What HR 112 does is it changes that period to 10 days and it makes it so that the person who's trying to buy a gun has to submit a bunch of documentation to the federal government explaining why they should be allowed to purchase this gun. It creates all these additional hoops that someone has to jump through. Now, on its surface, that may not seem like such a bad thing, right? Obviously, we don't want people to get guns who shouldn't be allowed to have guns, but Anyone who's tried to buy a gun this past year has noticed that the NICS system is taking a while. And there has been an increase in the number of three-day delay responses that comes with that because the system is almost overwhelmed. So what essentially this is doing is it takes those people who in the vast majority of cases are in fact legally allowed to own guns, and it now creates additionally reg additional regulatory hoops for them to jump through in order to exercise their constitutional right. And a right delayed 
is a right denied. So why are the Democrats floating these proposals now? And this is a strategic thing that we need to talk about. Any assault weapons ban before the midterm election would likely result in disaster. They know that, at least theoretically. But as I mentioned at the top half of the video, universal background checks do not prompt the same sort of visceral emotional response that a new assault weapons ban would. And this is in many ways a way to test the waters not only of public response, but also in the all-important Senate. And the reason why I say that is because the Senate is 50-50 right now. We know uh, Vice President Harris is the swing vote, but the filibuster complicates things. But what's even more complicated is the moderate Democrats like Joe Manchin, uh, the guy in Wyoming or Montana. It's one of those cold northern states. But especially Joe Manchin, because Joe Manchin actually introduced a background check bill back when Obama was president that ultimately ended up not going anywhere, but puts him on record as a supporter of universal background checks. So when these bills land in the Senate again or reland in the Senate, Joe Manchin will likely support them, which means that that's kind of our... He's like the swing, swing vote. Like he's the vote that swings things in the conservative direction and away from gun control, but he could also swing something like this for gun control. Additionally, it creates a problem because Joe Manchin is one of the holdout votes in not gutting the filibuster, which as I've talked about before, is the way that Republicans can prevent a lot of gun control legislation from even reaching a vote is by filibustering it because you need 60 votes to beat the filibuster. And Senator Manchin has said repeatedly that he is not in favor of removing the filibuster. But what if it's a piece of legislation he likes? Would he go back on his word to not remove the filibuster and help torpedo it just to get a piece of legislation that he favors through? I don't know. And that's what's concerning about this. It's concerning because I don't think gun owners have that same visceral response to background checks that they do to actual assault weapons bans. And it's concerning because trying to message against these is very difficult. It's easier to message against HR 112 because you can point out that the federal government isn't good at anything and that a right delayed is a right denied. And that this becomes a mechanism for removing people's ability to own guns that will disproportionately affect new gun owning populations. It will disproportionately affect the sort of people who don't have the time or resources to petition the federal government to write this letter to send in the documentation as to why they should be able to own these guns and will really only affect people who are kind of the most likely to need a gun for personal protection, which of course is exactly what the opposition always wants. They always want the poor and the disenfranchised to be more dependent on the state and to be more dependent on state resources for their protection and their employment and all of these other things. HR 8 is really hard to message against because on its surface you can look at it and go, oh, that doesn't seem that bad. But again, what it does is it creates additional barriers to helping people get access to their constitutional rights. If all of a sudden you have to go to a store, do a transfer, it put and do all of this other stuff when you're selling a gun to your friend that you know isn't a felon, the odds that you're actually gonna complete that transaction go down. And the end goal for any sort of bill like this is fewer gun owners. It has nothing to do with crime prevention. It has nothing to do with stopping guns from getting into the wrong hands. It's fewer gun owners because fewer gun owners means fewer people who are likely to vote against future gun control. I think that these are probably going... Now, again, we've got good intel that these are going to see a vote that as soon as this week. If something changes, we'll keep you updated here on Gun Nuts Media. I'm Caleb Giddings. Thanks for watching.